Today, I wanted to take you through a classical game that I played back in 2015, where I held a draw versus a grandmaster with 95% accuracy and a performance rating of 2600 in that game. Going to the game as a 13-year-old back then with a USDF rating of 2000 at the time, all I could hope for was to just hold my own as best and as long as I could versus such a strong player and potentially try to simplify it as much as I could if it wasn't too harmful for myself so that with the less pieces on the board, maybe the higher chance I could hold my own longer. Not saying that that was the correct mentality, but that's how I went into the game thinking. He was 2585 USDF at the time that we played, and he had had a peak FIDE rating of 2609, so I did not have high hopes. I wanted to show this game because, as you will see, there was nothing crazy tactical and there wasn't any major blunders, but it was a very positional game. Personally, I have always been a very positional chess player my entire life, and I really enjoy the intricacies of certain ideas in positional games that, at a glance, browsing through a game, you can't really find. So today, I wanted to take you through my game and certain key moments, ideas, and uncertainties that I had in my mind throughout this game on my way to holding a draw versus a really strong grandmaster. So I was playing white in this game, and we started off into a queen's game with a clan setup, where black plays an early bishop to b4. Now I'm gonna be honest, I know a lot of theory when it comes to queen's game with declines, but with early bishop b4 variations, I was not super comfortable. All I need to do was take my time, develop my pieces how I thought I would want to develop them, get my king safe, and go from there. So I decided to play a3 and to early off trade off that bishop for the knights. I didn't want to deal with knight of 6, knight e4, and c5 ideas because those lines can get a little bit sharp for me because I lack the understanding there. So I knew I didn't want to go into that. So after a3, we traded off the pieces and he played the move b6. Now in these lines here, I do have these double pawns very temporarily, but in majority of these lines, white will want to exchange for this pawn on d5. Here I was debating, did I really want to do that right away, or did I want to develop? I had different ideas such as e3, maybe knight f3, but the main thing that I was trying to figure out is where did I want this bishop? Did I want this bishop on e2 or d3, or did I want to even try some fianchetto with g3, bishop g2? So in this position here, I debated between c takes d5 immediately, did I want to go for e3? But then what would be the future of this bishop? Did I want to play knight f3? But most importantly, I wanted to prioritize castling, and therefore I wanted to get my bishop out as soon as possible. I went for something not as common, but I had seen before, the move g3 to go with fianchettoing my bishop and castling that way. He went on to play c6, which this move I was actually kind of happy to see, because normally in a setup like this, the whole purpose of b6 is to put your bishop on b7 and camp out on this diagonal here. But after the play the move c6, this is not really that effective anymore. And normally bishop b7 and c5 is a better setup. So I was definitely happy to see this, and I decided to keep on developing. So bishop g2, bishop a6. And here at this point, this was kind of my sign to take the pawn before I just completely lost the pawn for no compensation back. So we went with a trade-off here. The downside I felt to my position in this case was the fact that the c file was wide open, and it felt better for my opponents because my pawn is a backwards pawn in c3 and he had complete control over the c4 square. In these positions, whoever has control over the c4 square definitely has an advantage. Because my pawn kind of becomes a target, the square becomes a really nice outpost for a bishop or a knight, and it's really hard for me to develop and make progress on my queen side. So I knew very early on that this was going to be where a lot of the action might take place on, and I had to think about what I was going to do about that. But for right now, Again, I was just prioritizing getting my pieces out and castling. Now here I wanted to figure out where to get the rest of my pieces out. I was definitely prioritizing my dark square bishop. I debated going for an idea like a4, maybe bishop a3, and bring out my bishop on this diagonal. But again, I said in the intro that I was trying to simplify whenever I could in a way that wasn't harmful to me. And I decided to go with a move bishop g5 instead because I wanted to get this bishop traded for the knights. And again, simplify. I felt the less pieces on the board, the less scary the pressure on this pawn could become. And I felt the less of an advantage it was for black to have so much control over c4. So we played just some developmental moves. Going for this trade here. I could already tell my opponent's plan. They wanted to bring a rook to the c file. And a very common maneuver, especially when the square is weak, is to play the move knight a5 so the rook can hit this pawn on c3. And either the bishop can come to c4 or the knight can come to c4 as well and just sit there and completely lock up my queen side. The minute I saw my opponents playing through and I knew what they were playing for, I need to figure out what was I going to play for. I couldn't really play on the king side. There's no action going on here, no targets, nothing. And I didn't really know how to play on the queen side. I could maybe push my pawn to a4, but that's not really doing anything. It's not like I can play a5. 
I didn't see any real targets for me to hit, as expected, given I was playing in Grandmaster. So I decided maybe I needed to try to strike in the middle. So my goal was to play the move e4. I could have played e4 right away, but I was a little bit hesitant to open up this d file immediately. Because if e4 happened, and let's say this trade-off happened here, yes, the center becomes open a little bit, but it felt in the favor of my opponent because they could easily put a rook on d8, another rook on c8, and tension coming through straight down these files. If I can't really play the move d5 myself, what do I really have here as white? It seems a little bit hard for me to play, and I wasn't super comfortable opening up the position that soon. So I decided to prepare my idea with e4 by playing the move knight to d2. Preparing for this e4 move with more support backed behind the pawn with three pieces now instead of just my rook. Again, he followed through with the plan that I knew he was going to do, and then I hit with e4, forcing a trade off here. And after they took back, I honestly was not really sure what I wanted to take back with. I debated the knight, the bishop, and the rook, and I ended up choosing the knight, but I didn't really see an advantage for either piece, though I think it might have been a little bit better to take with my bishop and kind of put it on a better diagonal with more opportunities to maybe come back to b1, maybe play queen c2 and try to trade off bishops. When I took with the knight, I didn't think it was a bad move, but I just felt that this knight really didn't have a future on e4. It can't really go to any of these squares. So all I felt that it was really to on e4 was just adding a defender for my pawn on c3. My opponent continued with his idea, pressuring this pawn, completely dominating the c4 square. And in this position here, I felt that I needed to find a way to simplify or find a way to back up my pawn on c3 and make sure that if any piece landed on c4, that it wasn't super harmful for my position. Trading off knights seemed unrealistic to me. It didn't seem like he was ever going to trade his knight, and it didn't seem like there was a way to even get to his knight. Trading off rooks, trading off queens, it wasn't really easy to figure out a way to do that. And I felt that if I played a move like bishop f1, for example, well, firstly, he didn't have to take. And secondly, if he took on f1, was I going to spend a move moving my rook back where it came from? Or was I going to take with my king? That didn't seem that good. So instead, I decided to support my pawn on c3 by playing the move rook to e3. My idea behind this was I was actually baiting him to play knight c4. Not that it's bad for him in any way, but I just felt if they played the move knight c4 and then I could move my rook back where it came from, at least my knight was free to move maybe to d2 to try to trade off because now they blocked the rook and I didn't have to worry about my pawn being captured if my knight moved. So after the move rook e3, he played the move bishop to b7, which I honestly was a little bit surprised about. I originally thought that he was going to play the move knight c4 first to solidify his knight on the c4 square and then after I moved back, a move like bishop b7 made some sense. We're adding to a better diagonal firstly because the bishop does not really need to be on a6. The knight has plenty of support just on its own there. But when he played the move bishop b7 first, it felt like it was a better move order for me because after the move knight to d2 that I ended up playing, I offer a trade of bishops, which worked out for me because I'm trying to simplify. And I felt now if the knight ever moved, I have the first move, so I'm able to trade off if I wanted to. And I felt that that knight was too powerful to want to trade off so soon. So after knight d2, he ended up trading and then playing the move rook up to d8. So my main priority in this position was making sure that my pieces were defended, specifically my pawns on c3 and d4, and I wanted to be able to move my rook and queen out to better squares without hanging any material. Because one thing I did have to be careful about was the fact that this queen was staring at my pawn. So at this point in time, I thought to myself that I kind of had two options in terms of a plan. I could either play quite passively and just play some waiting moves and figure out what his next step was. Maybe play a move like a4, maybe try to get my queen out, maybe move it out to f3 or e2, just develop, maybe move my rook up one square. Or I could try to play for something myself. It was hard for me to figure out what exactly I wanted to play for, but I came up with a little bit of an idea. I played the move queen to e2. Earlier I talked about that my one break in the position was to go for the move e4, which I ended up doing. And after the e-file opened up, I thought, well, this is my best shot to try to open up the e-file more and maybe create a distraction on the king side or the center to alleviate some stress that I was feeling during the time when it came to the queen side. Specifically, again, this, these two pawns, c3 and a3, because both my rooks were pinned down to them, and you don't really want such major pieces pinned down to pawns, especially in an endgame where you don't have much pieces to work with in general. My opponent decided to just simply improve his pieces by playing a move rook to d5. And this is probably one of the more dubious moves I played in the game. I played the move f4. 
again i talked about i was trying to figure out some way to come up with a plan myself while f4 seemed a bit scary because it, it does open up my king and i felt like it weakens some squares around my king as well I didn't feel like he could actually capitalize on that super easily. Now again, if I were to go back in time, I don't really know if I'd play f4 again, honestly. Because I don't see any pros that f4 helps with that I can't play if f4 wasn't on the board. For example, if I want to play rook e5, I could easily have done that with the pawn still on f4. But I can't really play rook e5 anyway because my pawn's hanging. Originally when I played queen e2, I thought f4, f5 would have been a good idea. But given the rook is on d5 f5 doesn't really do anything anyway. And this was 13 year old me panicking a little bit and playing an impulsive move that hopefully the me today might not do. But I did feel that every single move that I made sort of need to have some purpose, if anything. If I gave my opponent endless time, I always tried to figure out where would he really want his pieces. It seemed that they were on optimal squares, but it didn't seem like he was attacking as much as he wanted to. So I thought maybe if this queen came to d7, let's say he shifted his rooks over, maybe a rook to b5, maybe a queen on d5 and knight to c4, maybe trying to run up these queenside pawns. I thought he was just going to completely dominate the queen side. So my next step was to find some way to either get my rooks more coordinated and on the board and not just babysitting my pawns, or find a way to get rid of his rooks. So after f4, he played the move b5, which I expected at some point after he played rook d5. Again, just helping out control the square on c4, maybe put his knight on c4, and maybe he wants to take with a pawn, or take with a rook, and then run his a5 pawn up. If he happened to play knight c4, and the knights were traded, and a move like a5 was played, this looked really, really nice of a queen side for black. So in my head again, my idea was I really wanted to play rook e5, but the problem is my pawn on c3 was a liability, so I decided to reposition my queen on f3, threatening to take on d5 because there's a pin, and also defending my pawn on c3, which meant that it allowed me to have this idea of rook e5 on the next move and hopefully trade off a rook. He moved out of the way. One advantage of him playing queen d7 is because the queen's not on e7 anymore, this pawn is not a target which meant that my rook was finally free after 22 moves. So I definitely hopped on that opportunity and I played the move rook e1, again developing my rook and supporting my idea of rook e5 so if a trade-off happens, I can recapture back with my rook. Here he went for the move knight to c4, which I was pretty happy to see because the whole time my knight on d2 has not been doing anything useful. I thought this was a really critical moment for him and I think he played knight c4 a bit too soon. I think there were still a lot of chances for him to improve his queen side before deciding if and what pieces he wanted to trade off. I thought playing a move like queen c6 and maybe even rerouting this knight, knight b7, maybe knight d6, and then a5, just building up more on the queen side was better because he has some time to play moves that might not pose an immediate threat but are improving his position and just kind of see what I do because I personally felt really stuck. Outside of rookie 5, I really had no other plan in mind, and I was probably just going to play waiting moves. Maybe move my pawns up slowly on the king's side, maybe try to go for some idea like f5 if it worked out, but again, I had to be really careful of this pawn on c3. So again, I thought a move like queen c6 would have been really good here, because again, I can't play rookie 5, because then I hang my pawn on c3. So that seemed like a better option for him. But instead, he ended up going with knight c4, and I was really happy to trade off knights here and then finish my idea with rook to e5. Now, here I was very nervous about my pawns on a3 and c3. He played the move rook to a4. I thought that he was going to trade off rooks, and just to give an example, after rook takes, rook takes. I was not a fan of this endgame for me, but I thought it was the best possible outcome that could have happened given what the position looked like five moves ago even. I felt that my pawns on a3 and c3 were really weak. There was not a single target, and I felt with some slow pressure, one of these pawns might have fallen at some point, or my pieces would have just been pinned down too much, and I thought I might crack under the pressure. And that's how I predicted the rest of the game to go. And I didn't like it, but I figured it was as close as I was getting to holding. However, he chose to play the move Rook A4 here, and I felt this was one of the last critical moments in the game where he really just gave away the advantage that he had. The reason for this is because he allows me to take his Rook first, regardless what kind of trade-off happens. Now, he has an isolated pawn, and for the very first time in the game, I felt that I had a target to play on. After the move for e 5 I can happily give up this A pawn, because at least I'm getting the D pawn back. So, we ended up trading, and I decided here that if we went into a rook end game, where he takes my C pawn, I take his B pawn, I was pretty confident about this, because there was a very high chance that he would go for my D pawn, and I would go for his A pawn. So I happily took with the queen, trying to force a trade off, and after we traded off, he tried to hang on to his pawn, then I hang on to my pawn on c3, and this is a very, very even endgame. We played a few more moves, 
and after he played the move a5 he offered me a draw and i thought about it for about a minute but then i happily accepted and in just over 30 moves i drew my first grandmaster over the board so again just like how i mentioned in the intro there wasn't anything major tactical that happened and there wasn't any main blunder that me or him made. The theme of this game was a lot of tension on the queen side, specifically my pawns on a3 and c3, and a lot of tension built up on the c4 square. I felt that he definitely held the advantage for the majority of the game, but not to a point where he was able to convert it properly. And after some key moments, especially the last key moment where he chose to play his rook to a4 instead of trading off rooks first and then playing rook to a4 it finally gave me a target to play on that made it really easy for me to hold a draw and a lot of these high rated chess games like i said so much of it is positional so much of it are both sides trying to play to either get off one certain move to play on a certain weak square to play on an isolated pawn or a backwards pawn and just keep the tension going until one cracks under it that's exactly how this game felt to me. So I hope you guys enjoyed this little analysis. Leave a comment below if this was helpful. Like and subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.